Hello, a very warm welcome to everyone here and those who are joining us via Zoom webinar. Thank you for joining us for this Data Science and Analytics Masterclass. Now, before we begin, there are some housekeeping announcements. Please adhere to the safe management measures. Maintain a safe distance of one meters apart. Sit in the de designated seats here in the LT and please keep your masks on throughout. In the event of an emergency, please follow the directions of the ushers and evacuate in an orderly manner. We also kindly remind everyone to please put your phone to silent mode. At the end of the masterclass, please exit the lecture theatre using the door on the right of the screen. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the masterclass, but feel free to send in your questions via the QR code, which you can see here on screen, or visit pollev.com slash Q&A LT27. That is P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M slash Q&A LT27. For those who are joining via the webinar, in the event that the Zoom session ends or disconnects unexpectedly, please join again at the same link. So I'm sure many of us had experiences with junk or spam emails clogging our inboxes. In this masterclass, we will analyze a publicly available data set to predict whether an email is a spam mail and understand some of the mechanisms behind automatic spam detection. Speaking today is Assistant Professor Sun Paolo from the Department of Statistics and Data Science. Prof Sun, please. Thank you, Shen Ru. Thank you, Shen Ru. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really great to see you all here uh, in person. So uh, my name is Sun Bao Luo, and I'm a faculty member with the Department of Statistics and Data Science here at NUS. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, how do you detect spam email. I'm sure this is a topic that, uh, that uh, is of interest to all of us, especially recently. Uh, my, I myself received a lot of uh, spam messages, uh, e emails or, or SMS, right? Or calls. So, uh, how can data analytics help us to detect such unwanted messages? So that will be the uh, topic I wish to cover today, but of course, at a very basic level. Um, but I will be talking about some possible extensions later uh, at the, towards the end of, the, uh, of today's masterclass. Uh, also, towards the end, you will have some opportunities to ask questions. Okay, so, uh, so first slide is about the data deluge. Uh, there's a high volume of data being created every day in our society and the complexity of data types and structure is only increasing right, rapidly. Uh, and the speed of new data creation and growth is a phenomenal. Uh, especially in recent years, uh, a lot of the things that we are doing actually took place online, right? Education, uh, our financial transactions, uh, the, way we, uh, the way we entertain ourselves, right? Uh, all of these activities will leave a trail of data. So the speed of data creation is increasing and this highlights the need for people and students uh, well-versed in the ways of data analytics, right, to help to uh, extract meaning from these large data sets. Okay. Some examples, uh, one is from the health sciences. The cost of DNA sequencing is decreasing exponentially. 
So now there are companies that uh, for a small payment allows for the sequencing of your genome. And based on, the, based on your genomic data, they can help to trace your lineage or help to predict right, whether you are susceptible to certain diseases or not. So this, this uh, genomic data is actually uh, very large right, in size. But in recent years, the cost has been coming down tremendously. Uh, next example is from the uh, entertainment industry, right? Uh, for example, you, you watch a show on Netflix, right? And at the end of which uh, you will be given certain recommendations, right? Based on the shows that you have watched, uh, based on the, uh, the genre of the movies. And so all these uh, makes use of predictive analytics from data science, uh, at the back end. Another example is uh, online shopping. I'm sure all of us are doing uh, online shopping a lot uh, in recent years, at least for myself. So if you are, say, interested in data science and you, even before entering university, you started reading a lot of books on data science and analytics, then probably you will be recommended uh, more books of the same uh, topics after you click buy in the cart. So I'm going to quote uh, Hal Varian, who is a very famous uh, economist. So the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, uh, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize it, and to communicate it, that's going to be a hugely important skill in the next decades, not only at the professional level, but even at the educational level for elementary school kids, uh, for college kids. So because essentially we have free and ubiquitous data. So what it means is that uh, it used to be that we, we go to school and we need to learn of course, the languages in order to communicate with each other. Uh, we need some basic quantitative skills, uh, such as uh, counting, and then we move on to things like algebra and then uh, calculus. And uh, I'm not sure what is the uh, A-level syllabus now. I'm sure you have, uh, many of you are more well-versed in the high school mathematics than I am now. But uh, what this quote is saying is data science and the ability to understand and to extract value from it is going to be such an essential skill over the next few decades. As essential as uh, your English or your mother tongue or, or mathematics or science, right? So it's very important. And I quote this report on the future economy. The data will be an increasingly important source of comparative advantage, and we need to improve our ability to use it productively in the economy. All right, so here at home, uh, we have the Smart Nation Initiative, where people are empowered by technology to lead meaningful and fulfilled lives. So data science can really help uh, to improve the lives of everyday Singaporeans. So we had some examples in which uh, uh, in the past, data science was used to help uh, understand, right? Why the MRT broke down uh, or stopped at certain times by analyzing the, uh, the, the data that arise from uh, the, the such systems. Um, and, uh, and many more and such examples abound, right? So data science is close to us in the sense that we are not going to just learn the uh, theory or the implementation, which are very important, of course, but in fact, they are really uh, influencing and helping us in our everyday lives in Singapore and everywhere else. So uh, I took up 10 minutes there to introduce a little bit, and I hope that uh, 
you are excited about uh, learning data science. So the, the key issue is that you may be interested in history, you may be interested in the languages, uh, you may be interested in uh, the arts, but no matter which field you may be interested in, data science will probably play a role in your pursuit next time. So, uh, so that is the key message uh, that uh, I wish to uh, uh, provide you in the first 10 minutes. And so in the remaining time, I will talk a little bit about uh, the topic at hand today, which is how do we predict spam messages, right, in, from, uh, in your mailbox. So here where I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an important application in data science, which involve making predictions about the outcome based on a number of predictors. So in many cases, the outcome is a categorical variable or class membership. So uh, I, I will provide you with a few examples uh, shortly. So we'll talk about the k-nearest neighbor classification, which is a popular supervised learning method for class membership prediction in data science. So of course, today I'm going to talk about it at a very basic level, but I will also uh, discuss with you some possible extensions. And uh, interestingly, uh, a wide subset, a large subset of the methods in data science uh, involves variations of the uh, k-nearest neighbor classification. So all of them uh, seems to be variations on a common theme. Okay, okay some examples. Uh, this, was a, this was a newspaper article from a few years ago. Uh, Health Minister Gang Kim Yong said that diabetes, right, the war on diabetes costing the country more than a billion dollars a year, right? And of the more than 400,000 diabetics, then one in three do not even know they have the disease. So it will be good for us to have an automated, uh, or in other words, we have a predictive algorithm that we can implement so that anyone right, may make use of this method to help to predict his or her uh, diabetic uh, diabetes status. Right? So this is a very relevant example for Singapore. So what we are trying to do is basically to predict an outcome that has only two values. Either we have the disease or we do not have the disease. So this is an example of a binary outcome. And how are we going to predict this outcome is to make use of predictors. So we are going to assume that our attributes Right, such as our gender, BMI, our lifestyle choices, they are informative and they can predict whether we have the, uh, we have, we have, uh, we are at risk to develop diabetes or not. So that is the essence of what we are trying to do here. Okay, so this is, uh, so actually there's an existing uh, risk classification uh, website here, right? So this is another example of classification technique from data science being implemented in practice and helping Singaporeans. Our second example is uh, algorithms for handwritten number recognition, which is really important for automatic sorting procedures, right? For the postal mails and check deposits. So nowadays we, we tend to uh, order a lot of things online and the number of you know, parcel uh, worldwide is growing and uh, there, there are already some congestions, right, recently. So this, so data science plays a role in help to uh, speed up the sorting of such parcels or mails, right? So you do not want a human to be there to, to sort uh, where this postal code goes to, right? So what the, algorithm does is to look at this image, right? So on the left-hand side, you can see that different people write the digits differently, right? 
but they share some commonality, right? So you can train the predictive algorithm such that given an image, so the image itself is a predictor, right? And now the outcome is no longer only two values, uh, but 10 different values, right? The digits from zero to nine. But nonetheless, it is still a classification algorithm. So given this image, the algorithm should be able to predict, right? What digit it is automatically. So this is another example of uh, classification or classific uh, classification algorithm at work. Okay, so as we mentioned, the task is to predict from the image matrix of pixel intensities, the identity of each image quickly and accurate. Uh, so the third example concerns finance. Uh, again, uh, here, we may, be, uh, we may go to a website and try to uh, apply for a credit card, right? So I think uh, all, uh, many of you are at the beginning stages of uh, uh, getting in touch with such uh, systems. And uh, sometimes we may go online to uh, obtain loans. And uh, you can, it is possible that you may get granted the loan immediately. Right? or your credit card application is approved immediately. So how does this happen at the back end? This is another example of uh, classification, right? So before you apply for the loan, you need to input uh, certain background information about yourself. For example, your age, uh, possibly gender, uh, your salary and uh, your education level, things like that. And based on a, a, a classification algorithm, the bank will decide whether to approve or deny your application on the spot, right? So if your case is not so clear cut, maybe it will be assigned to a, a bank executive, right? To evaluate your case. Okay, and then our and then I always tell my students in, in, in class, so I've been teaching an introductory data science class over the past few semesters. Uh, in theory, we can try to come up, make use of the top, the things that we learn in class to try to predict the movements of the stock market. Okay, so perhaps we just need to predict whether on any given day, the market will go up or down, right? So just two values, binary outcome. So I always encourage my students, if they ever manage to come up with such an algorithm, right? And it works very well, right? Please do not approach anyone else but me, right? As the instructor, okay? Because I, I would need to have a good discussion with you to see how we can make use of this algorithm that you have developed, all right? So I hope that if you join the, the, the data science or NUS next time, and you attend my class, please study hard. And if you ever do find such an algorithm, please just promise me that I will be the pr first person you approach for further development, okay? So that aside, I'm going to come to um, what I'm going to talk about today, which is, uh, based on certain features, such as keywords, uh, email providers use classification methods to decide whether the incoming email messages are spam or not, right? So here, again, the outcome is a class membership with only two classes, so whether it's a spam or a non-spam. And I'm sure every one of us uh, do indeed have experiences with receiving uh, spam emails. So what are we trying to, so we are trying to predict whether any given email is a spam or not, right? So what should we make use of in order to do that? So certain features such as counts of certain keywords like free or winner. So if your email contains a lot of the instances of the word free, then um, it may be uh, suspected 
uh, spam case, right? And then if you have a lot of phrases, you are a winner, you are a winner. Okay, in life, we don't get that a lot, but uh, in, in, in spams, we do get uh, that a lot. So that will be another feature that may be predictive of the spam status of the email. All right, again, here, the outcome is a class membership with only two classes, spam or non-spam. Okay, so this graph is a little bit, you know, this is about as technical as today's talk gets. So I will spend uh, one or two minutes explaining what I'm trying to do here. So say we have, we have available a data set and people have already labeled humans, right? Humans have already labeled whether an email is spam or non-spam. So each of these dots represents such an email, and we already know whether it is spam or not, okay? So the red dots, uh, the orange dots represent spam, and the blue dots represent non-spam. Right, so uh, now we have access to this data set and we already know they are true spam or non-spam status. Then we plot all these dots on this Cartesian plane, on this Cartesian plane. So what this plane represents is a feature space. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, such features may include the count of the number of words a winner and the count of the number of words free. So you may think of the X, uh, the Y and the X axis as the counts of such words. So now we assume there are only two features, right? For each email. So for each email we have there are Y and the X values. So just to tie in with what we are familiar with, we assume there are only two features. So having said that, we can plot everything now on this Cartesian plane, and we know they are true spam or non-spam status. So let's say we are interested in, um, wondering if I can do the annotation here. Okay. So let's say we are interested in the spam or non-spam status of a new email, right? The new email we may come with its own set of feature values. For example, the new email may have uh, five instances of the word free and maybe eight instances of the word winner. So how do we plot, um, how do we plot this email on the feature space? So maybe it's here, right? So this new incoming email, the status is unknown, right? We do not know whether it's spam or not, but looking at this, Cartesian plane, right, representing the feature space. It is very easy to say that, well, this email appears to be very close to this cluster of blue points that we know for sure to be non-spam. So how about that we predict this new email to be a non-spam, right? So that is uh, very intuitive, right? Um, so, to, so a way to formalize that is, let's say we just draw this line, right? And if any new emails feature value. So remember for the new email, we do not know it's label, spam or non-spam, but we do know the features, right? We, we can count the number of the words winner and free in the email itself. And so we know the feature value and we can plot for that new email is positioned in this Cartesian plane, right? So, so if the email happened to land here, then we may want to predict it to be a spam, right? So by drawing this line, we are saying that uh, if an email lands in this part of the feature space, right? Then we will predict that email to be non-spam and Otherwise, if it's on the upper uh, left-hand side of the Cartesian plane, then we are going to predict it to be spam, okay? So, so far, I think uh, everything is quite intuitive. 
And this is the simplest way, in fact. In fact, this is a, the way to classify already, right? So this is a linear classifier, right? So, uh, uh, so we, we may not be so, um, some of you may not be satisfied in the sense that this is too simple, right? You may not be able to capture some uh, small subtle subtleties. So for example, here, uh, it appears that this part uh, has a lot of uh, spam emails as well, right? So is that a way to make this uh, decision, uh, decision surface take into account that? Okay, oh, I'm trying to erase that. So the answer of course is yes. So we will make use of the k-nearest neighbor classifier. So what this means is that, so what this means is that suppose our new, uh, our new email is here, right? Remember that we do not know the identity of this a new email, but we do know its feature values. And so we can plot this uh, new email in the feature space. So what we are going to do is, we are going to look at the nearest neighbors in the feature space to this new email, right? That we already know they are spam or non-spam status. So if we set k equals to three, then we are saying we look at the k the three nearest neighbor around us in the feature space, okay? And we try to decide our own identity based on our three nearest neighbors in the feature space. So here you can easily see that uh, in the feature space, the three nearest uh, data points, one is a spam and two are non-spam, right? So we will predict uh, for this new email, the identity, Right? Since there are two out of three non-spam emails in the vicinity, we will predict its status to be non-spam, right? Um, so, of course, there are questions like, how do you measure distance? So we will make use of the Euclidean distance, which I'm sure all of you have uh, computed <laughs> many times uh, in, your, in your high school mathematics. So if we do that for every point in the feature space, so here, this point is somewhere here. If we do this three nearest neighbor classification for every point in the feature space, we are going to come up with this decision surface, right? So you will satisfy yourself by looking at, for example, this point is three nearest neighbors are spam. So we will, uh, so we will color this part to be orange, right? And for these points, every point in the blue colored region uh, if you go by the three nearest neighbor classification, you are going to predict uh, an email with that set of feature values to be a non-spam, okay? So by doing that for every value in the feature space, you can come up with this decision surface, which clearly looks different from the line that we drew earlier, right? It appears to capture more of the local features in the, in the feature space, okay? So in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, go quickly and then uh, Shen Ru can uh, go proceed with the uh, Q&A. So this is uh, the decision surface involving three nearest neighbor. So remember earlier, we just drew a line, right? We just drew a line. Let me see where's the line, okay. So we, we did something like this earlier, but now we, when we use the k nearest neighbor with k equals to three, we see that the decision surface appears to be different, right? It is more sensitive to local, uh, local features uh, in the decision surface. And this is a case with uh, k equals to uh, 100, right? This uh, decision surface, involving uh, using your 100 nearest neighbor around you. And as you can see, it is not so weakly as before. It is more smooth. It appears to be uh, more similar to the straight line that we drew before. So uh, you will learn next time that by 
varying the value of K, the classifier that you come up with may enjoy different properties, right? And uh, this, some of these properties involve trade-offs that uh, will help to decide which value of K that you should use based on your own particular project needs. Or in the next time when you work as data scientist, based on the specific domain that you happen to work in, right? And uh, if you happen to join my class next time, uh, I will be happy to discuss with you these trade-offs and what are the different properties that, uh, that comes with varying this value of K, okay? So here, uh, this is an actual data set that I welcome all of you to explore if you have time. Uh, this is publicly available. So it, it just contains 4,000 plus emails. So those, these 4,000 plus emails are just like the dots that we plotted on the, uh, on the Cartesian plane earlier, and they have their spam or non-spam status, right? So based on that, you are able to train your k-nearest neighbor classifier, right? And then try to predict whether your email that you receive, right? is in fact a spam or non-spam, okay? So, uh, so I'm going to skip this part. And so for this set of emails, what I observe is that the Ken Yeros neighbor classifier uh, happens to work better if the value of K is very small, right? So as you can see, Earlier in the earlier example, if you have a small value of k, i.e., you are taking into account the, lab the labels of only a small neighborhood around you, uh, then the decision surface is highly irregular and very wiggly, right? N not so smooth. And it appears that that type of uh, decision surface or classification scheme uh, works better for this data set. Okay, so we are also, uh, if you uh, join my class or any of the classes in data science or statistics next time, you will be able to learn how to evaluate the performance of your classifier, right? So here I have illustrated a little bit of that. And in conclusion, I would just like to reiterate what I said earlier about uh, in fact, a large data set, a large subset of the most popular techniques in data science and analytics are, are variants of the K nearest neighbor classifier that we have just seen, right? So there are many possible extensions. Uh, for example, now, when we look at the three nearest neighbor, we just assign whether a neighbor is in the K nearest or not. So effectively, we just ignore those that are outside of this neighborhood. But we can come up with weights, right, that effectively decrease smoothly uh, from, based on the distance in the feature space from our test data point. And in high dimensional spaces, we can modify the distance kernels to emphasize some variable more than others. So instead of the Euclidean distance, we can modify how we measure the distance uh, to take into account the fact that in high dimensional spaces, uh, there's a, due to the so-called curse of dimensionality, we may not be able to find so many neighbors that are close to us, okay? So with that, I would like to end uh, my class today. I, I would like to uh, 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 welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Soon, for guiding us through this masterclass. We will now be opening the floor to questions. You may send in your questions by scanning the QR code here on screen or visit pollev.com slash QA LT27. My apologies, the QR code is not on screen, so please just go to the link above.
my apologies. Due to the safe distancing mic management measures, we won't be able to use the mic here. So do yeah. send your questions over. Yeah, the question. yeah you can, I can hear you actually. <laughs> Uh, thank you. What was your name? And can you introduce a little bit about yourself? <laughs> yeah. You just uh, came out from NS. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Uh, so that's a very good question. How do we come up with such label data set, right? So that is the, actually the most uh, label intensive part. Uh, based on my experience with any kind of data analytics. So because it takes human to actually label. So one good example is there are some collaborative projects. For example, there was a one time Google was making use of all the online users to help to label whether an image is a cat, right? Uh, so, so you can participate and volunteer uh, in these activities. And so, uh, so whenever we label the image to be a cat or non-cat, we are actually contributing to this data set that I talked about earlier. And imagine with so many online users in, in the world, uh, very quickly we can build up a, data, a huge data set, right? Uh, in, in the companies, uh, probably we will need people to help us. And so we will need to hire, for example, uh, analysts and data entry uh, personnel to help us curate this type of data sets. So, so it, is, it is a very expensive process uh, most of the time. Yeah, that's a very good question. I hope I have answered a little bit about it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dr. Soon. All right, um, let's answer some questions that are uh, from the poll. Uh, I'm Lim Tiong Wee. I'm an associate uh, professor in the department, uh, a colleague of Dr. Soon. So, um, so there's this question here, what's the difference between statistics and data science and analytics? Um, and there, there are a few ways to look at this. Uh, from a curriculum uh, point of view, uh, both majors are offered within the College of Humanities and Sciences. Okay, so students who are admitted into the uh, humanities and sciences course have the choice to declare either statistics or data science analytics as their major, and in subsequent semesters to move between them, okay? And from a you know, um, curriculum point of view, the curriculum for the first couple of years between statistics and DSA are quite similar. So, uh, and that will include things uh, that you actually have to take from the core curriculum uh, in CHS, uh, and also modules in mathematics, uh, including linear algebra and calculus, modules in programming, okay? So, um, rather than to say, well, you choose statistics, that's the end of the story, you're, you're stuck with it, or you choose DSA, that's the end of the story, you're stuck with it. I, I think a better approach, which is what we typically advise students, is to um, pick one major, you have to pick a major anyway to start with, but because the fundamental preparatory modules are very similar, you take those and then you branch out into either stats modules or DSA modules, and you decide for yourself which one is more suitable for you. Okay, there is um, a tendency uh, that we observe from students, okay, to chase after hot terms. Data science is a hot term now, okay? And clearly, if, you, if that's something you want to do, by all means, do it. Uh, but the, the skills that you pick up between statistics and DSA, uh, to be totally honest, they are not very different. It's just how much of it you have, okay? By design, our DSA curriculum has three almost equal parts in statistics, mathematics, and um, computing, all right, it's computer science. But by design, the stat curriculum will be have a lot of statistics and some math and some 
computer science. Okay, the curriculum space is the same. So, so what we put into the curriculum space depends on the focus. All right. And um, so that's um, uh, my take on that question. Uh, what is needed to do well in data science as with any other subject? To, I mean, there's a prerequisite. Uh, in this instance, H2 math. So um, I would suggest that you come in with quite a good grade for H2 math in this instance. But also, I think the passion and, and, and I think logical thinking as well, whether it's data science or whether it's statistics, a lot of it is data analysis, okay? And that means trying to understand the context within which the data arises, okay? And then, uh, you know, go through logical thinking to find out what's the best way to approach uh, this data sets to find value in it. So I think uh, good math, an open mind, okay? Because your techniques need to go somewhere else uh, to a domain to be applied and your ability to pick up uh, nuances, okay, or jargon in another domain is important as well. So, uh, so I think that's some of the skills you may need uh, or aptitude you may need for data science. Most common second major for students who take DSA, at the moment, it's computer science. But we also have students who do a second major in economics, uh, students who do a second major in management. The second major in management is the second major for business administration. It's a different name. What's the benefit for doing this? Uh, well, the, the answer for against math and stat is pretty straightforward. Math and stat belong to the same course. They're just different majors. So it's easy to make, move between them. Okay, so the same advice that I um, sort of provided earlier applies. Uh, you have to choose a major, but because the three majors have common preparatory modules, um, after you have a sense of what you really are good at, you can then decide on a final one. CS is a bit more complex because CS belongs to another faculty or school, okay? Which means that you want to change your mind later on, it's a cost transfer, and that's relatively much more complex. So what's the difference between, uh, say, you know, uh, the math-based subjects, whether it's math stat or DSA and CS? Um, well, these days it isn't that much more that much difference. Computer scientists do become data scientists, okay? Data scientists do become computer scientists. We have had students graduate from the DSA program who become software engineers. Okay, so so anything is possible, and this ties back also to the curriculum within NUS. It's designed so that they have ample space for a second major or a minor. That means on top of your major, whatever that might be, we hope it's DSA, all right? But uh, at the end, it's a decision. Uh, you can add on a second major, you can add on a minor to round up your preparation for your career. So, so you can essentially you know, um, think about what you wanna do over the next four years or so, all right? Learn things that's needed, and then they'll prepare you for a career. So with you the time constraints, yes. maybe we'll just have one last question or sure. any last words. Yes, you can have no coding experience to do DSA. The first course that you will do is a CS 1010S module on programming methodology that requires no prior computing experience, but you do need to work hard. All right. So we hope you apply to HNS. All right and then eventually do DSA as a major. Thank you very much. Good to see all of you. Thank you all for your curiosity and thank you, Prof, for answering our participants' questions. Should you have any other questions, you may send us an email at the email address shown here on screen. Now know that all of you have a lot of questions on POEV and unfortunately, we could not get to all of them along with the ones in the Zoom chat. So for now, we have reached the end of our masterclass, data analytics.
for detecting spam email. We hope that you have been able to learn more about this course and enjoyed your glimpse into learning at today's experience, NUS Open House. There are many activities that have been planned for you today around the campus, such as student life activities happening at U-Town. We wish you a good day ahead and please exit the lecture theatre via the door here on my left. Thank you.